This lesson is about patterns and mechanisms of evolution. So we've talked before, we've talked about the fact that evolution occurs in populations, not in individuals. And so we need to look at two major patterns in evolution. One is macroevolution, which is large-scale patterns over long periods of time. And then there's microevolution, which is talking more about specific mechanisms. So several different things are involved in macroevolutions. We have extinctions, adaptive radiation, convergent evolution, coevolution, and punctuated equilibrium. So we'll talk about each one of these. Extinctions are pretty easy. You understand what extinctions are. That's just when you have massive loss of, of uh, numbers. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. So here we have some pictures to see about what one you think is which. Uh, this represents convergent evolution when you have species that end up, that are vastly different from each other, but end up looking sort of like each other because they live in the same kind of environment and have same, similar adaptations. Then we have coevolution where the pollinators evolve with the flowers, the, the change in the flowers. Uh, responds to or or causes a response in the pollinator to change something about it. Gradual gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium is talking about uh, that sometimes they're just gradual changes over time. They end up in separate species and other times there are big jumps that happen for various reasons. And then we have um, um, adaptive radiation where you have one ancestral spe species that ha it ends up being um, ancestral to many daughter species because of different environments that they live in. So we'll talk about each one of these. Coevolution is when you have <coughs> some adaptations that the, that the two species adapt to each other over time. Um, and here we have an example. This is a type of moth that has a very, very long proboscis. That's its feeding part because it feeds on this particular flower and what it needs to feed on is way down here. And so what this shows is that over time, as the, <coughs> as the uh, flower's tube to, to get to the nectar increased in length, the, to, the, the pollinator's proboscis increased in length also in order to be able to feed on that flower. So they changed in response to changes in each other. And that's called coevolution. That ha you see it often in insects and, po in insects and, and flowers. But there are other examples as well. But that's, uh, that's just they, two species change or adapt in response to changes in each other. Convergent evolution is when you have vastly different species with different backgrounds that end up being very similar because they have similar habitats. And this particular slide shows you some pictures of, of um, uh, placental mammals, which are the kind of mammals that we have in, the, in our part of the world, and then the marsupials, which are the kind of mammals that they have in Australia and New Zealand <coughs> and um, parts of New Guinea. These have, instead of having babies like we have, the babies are born very, very early, and then they migrate from the, from the birth canal to a pouch where they continue their development. And an example of a marsupial would be like a, um, a kangaroo, but also possums that we have here in North America. <coughs> and so they're different. They have different origins. They're both mammals, but they have different origins and very, very different things. But they have, there are a number of striking examples of, of animals from these two groups that are very similar to each other and their habitats and their and their um, habits are very similar to each other. So here we have a wolf and a Tasmanian wolf. You know, this is a placental mammal, this is a marsupial, and they look a whole lot alike. Um, and they live in the same kind of habitat and live kind of the same way, but they're very different from each other um, in terms of their development. A couple of other examples, a flying squirrel uh, from the placental group and the flying phalanger from a, from a marsupial. And then here's a marsupial mouse and a, and a placental mouse. Again, they look very similar to each other because they live in, in similar ways and have similar adaptations. Adaptive radiation is when you have an ancestral species that over time develops into numerous different species that live in different ways. And this is an example. This is the Galapagos finches, some of the birds that, that um, Darwin observed. <coughs> uh, he hypothesized, and it's been shown to be, uh, that there has been evidence to support his hypothesis that there was an ancestral species that got blown to some of the easternmost islands. And the ones that had adaptations that allowed them to live there 
you know, adapted to that environment, but others that got blown to different islands lived in different ways, and so they, they ended up with lots of different, uh, lots of different beak shapes and sizes, so depending on what they needed to eat. So the ones that eat seeds have big, heavy beaks to break the seeds open. One that eat, you know, need to dig into like cactus, cactuses and things like that have a different kind of beak. Those that live on insects have different kinds of beaks related to that, and, and again, it has to do with which adaptations were present in the ancestral um, birds that were there and those that were able to survive and reproduce passed on their traits to subsequent generations and over time they developed into vastly different species. They all have some similarities and they're all definitely finches but they live in different ways and definitely have different beak shapes. Now catastrophism is when you have natural events that change environmental conditions abruptly and oftentimes this results in something like a mass extinction. We can think back to the meteorite strike back in 65 million years ago that took away the dinosaurs eventually. That's an example of catastrophism, but there have been a number of mass extinctions in Earth's past uh, and a lot of them have been related to some kind of climate change or some kind of a catastrophe that happened. So. Uh, Think about what effect a catastrophe might have on the process of evolution. Those organisms that do survive the catastrophe have some sort of adaptation that allow them to continue living and developing. And then those that are those that are left are going to be able to fill in lots of habitats that are now empty because some of their some of the occupants have have become extinct. And so that, so oftentimes after mass extinctions you have a big bloom of, of, of increased speciation because of the organisms that are living behind taking advantage of now vacant uh, habitats. That's what leads to something like punctuated equilibrium a lot of times. Now a lot of times over time you'll see a gradual change in organisms and this does happen but when you do have those ca catastrophic events oftentimes you end up with uh, something that you know vastly separates two groups from each other and so they, they change more quickly into sp separate species because of their conditions that they happen to find themselves in. So there's a lot of a lot of things here. There's a lot of evidence about all of these kind of things and um, it's very interesting to see to follow kind of what happens in different species to see how they change. Microevolution is talking about changes in frequency of genes over time. When we look at uh, something like this curve here that we saw similar to what we saw with the skin color uh, curve, <coughs> this is called a normal distribution of traits in a population and the average value is usually has the highest number of um, individuals that exhibit that trait. And as you move farther away from the average in one direction or the other, there are fewer and fewer to get to the extremes. This is a, called a bell-shaped curve, and this is the normal distribution that you normally see in all kinds of things that have uh, different kind of traits. Uh, very often you see this in polygenic traits like we saw with the skin color graph that we saw during genetics. Now, if, if things change to make conditions un survivable at one end of the spectrum or the other, what we're going to see is something called directional selection. Okay, so let's talk about giraffes. Uh, if there were giraffes with shorter necks and the food sources on the lower branches were eaten by other animals, the lower, the shorter neck giraffes would die off and leave only the longer neck giraffes. So they would be the ones that survived to reproduce and pass on that trait of having a longer neck. And so over time, the normal distribution of individuals in the population would shift from this original norm or average to a new average that was going to be larger or higher. So that's the uh, after the selection of whatever it was. So whatever it was, if it was the if it was the competition for food on the lower branches that killed off the shorter neck giraffes, then that's going to over time change the distribution of the population uh, of giraffes in an upward direction. Now when you see di different kinds of changes here about different kinds of selection. Okay, the original population is here. Here we're looking at mice of different colors. So they, they vary in color from, from white or almost white to a very dark gray or almost black. Um, if something happened to make it uh, disadvantageous to be either extreme or the other, then you'd end up with it. The average would be this uh, around the same number, but the, but the peak would be higher. And so maybe the same color would be here, and, but there would be more of them at that high, height, and there would be less uh, variation between one extreme and the other. This is called stabilizing selection. So the average, the average value stays about the same, but the numbers of individuals at that value increases.
Directional selection, like we saw with the example of the of the giraffes, uh, happens when the when the curve shifts one direction or the other. Let's say um, there was something that caused the lighter colored mice to be able to picked off, be picked off easier by predators. Then that makes it a disadvantage to be a lighter colored mouse. And so over time, you'll see the colors of the mouse population darkening, and then you'll get a shift in the over time. You'll get a shift in the uh, in the normal distribution toward the darker end of the spectrum. Or if there was some disadvantage to being that average color, and it was an advantage to be very light colored or very dark colored, you would see what we call disruptive selection that's going to cause actually two different peaks. And this is most often what's going to cause a type of evolution to occur, a type of speciation to occur to, to develop new species because of, um, of the separation there. They can, this can be really extreme sometimes, and that can make a big difference. Genetic drift is a change in the gene pool due to chance. And here's an example of something called bottlenecking. Let's say you had a great deal of variation in the original population, and there was some sort of catastrophe, and only a few individuals survived just by chance, just because they happened to be in the right place at the right time. So you end up with a fewer in your po surviving population. What do you think the next generation is going to look like? You're not going to see any of this orange, or very little of the orange, if it's recessive, because you've got more purple and green here. And so that's going to change an overall distribution in the in the uh, allele populate in the gene pool based on just chance. This leads us to talk about something called the Heidi Hardy-Weinberg principle. Hardy-Weinberg principle states that gene frequencies do not change in a population. In other words, it stays at equilibrium as long as there's a large population, random mating occurs, there's no movement into or out of the population, no mutations, and no natural selections. Now, this doesn't exist in nature. And so you end up with gene frequencies do that gene frequencies do change over time because uh, sometimes you have a smaller population, or there's no such thing as random mating in the population. It's just it's not just random. It's it's chosen for some reason or another, maybe behavioral or whatever. Uh, no movement into or out of the population would be no immigration or no emigration, no mutations. Well, that can be difficult to. Um, prevent and no natural selections. In other words, everything is, is just fine the way it is and nothing is going to change. And that doesn't really happen in nature. But it's an interesting thing and you can calculate these frequencies, which we will not do in this class, but you can read about it a little bit in your book in chapter 14. So how do populations evolve? Okay, well, they're, they're oftentimes evolved because of isolating mechanisms that prevent populations from inter interbreeding. And as a result, you end up with separate species that end up forming. Here's a picture, a graph that shows you different kinds of uh, yarrow plants, okay, and they're where they're found. And notice they have different heights and different distribution of the leaves, and the flowers are in different locations. And it, it's related to which side of the Sierra Nevadas they're located on, okay? The ones that are over here are going to have very great difficulty cross-pollinating with the ones over here because they're so far apart. And oftentimes you see, like, here's a little hill that separates those, and so you find a different population in there. They may be similar, but not exactly the same. Part of their difference is going to be dependent upon their elevation because they're not going to be able to grow as high at higher altitudes because of increased irradiation from the sun and less air and so forth. But they're, they're by, pre, by being on opposite sides of the mountain range, that would prevent them from cross-pollinating and interbreeding and eventually possibly lead, lead to um, different species forming. <clears throat> Here's a definition of a species for you. Uh, it's a group whose members can interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. And the, and the process of speciation is the formation of new species. And there are several different kind of isolating mechanisms ca that can lead to speciation. We looked at one, which was geographic isolation, basically. And we're going to talk about a couple of others. Habitat isolation is when you have members of the same species that live in vastly different habitats. Here we have some snakes that, that live. One lives in the desert, one lives in the water. They're not going to come in contact with each other very often because their habitats do not overlap, and so therefore over time they will probably speciate or, de or develop into separate species. Temporal isolation is when you have groups that are active at different times of day or different seasons of the year. Here we have two different skunks. One is obviously daytime, one is nighttime, and they don't, they're not going to be active at the same time, so they're not going to interbreed. Behavioral isolation is when they respond differently to behavioral activity, especially mating behavior. Uh, these are some; these are birds called blue-footed boobies. You may have heard of those before. Um, 
and they have a very specific mating behavior and if there's a difference in the mating behavior the one mate is not going to accept the other because they don't perform the, put the prescribed dance or whatever they have to do and that's going to separate them from each other and prevent them from interbreeding. That can be due to just uh, <coughs> a slight difference in geographic location uh, or lots of other things that can cause that as well. Sometimes there's also mechanical isolation. Here we have two snails that their shells spiral oppositely to each other and because of that, that presents a mechanical barrier to their mating. Their, their uh, sex organs cannot come in contact with each other and they are therefore no longer able to exchange gametes and so sometimes there's some kind of mechanical barrier. A lot of insects have very specific mating parts that can only fit a specific way into a, into a member of their species and uh, it won't work any other way and so that would be a type of mechanical isolation also. And then there's gametic isolation. This is when the eggs of one species can't be fertilized by sperm from another and you often see this in uh, sea creatures. Here we have two different kinds of sea anemones and they're both going to shed their, the way they, they mate is they shed the sperm into the water and then it just travels until it comes in contact with another anemone of the same type and is able to fertilize eggs. If it comes into eggs of a different species, they can't be fertilized and that's gametic isolation. So all of these isolating mechanisms can over time lead to speciation or the development of a new species.